eight out of ten entomologists agree that the other two are just ambitious ant colonies disguised in lab coats. Don't let them know we figured it out, or they could become aggressive. Welcome to the Crypto Naturalist. Howdy, listeners. Today's the kind of show I love. The kind that breaks down the imaginary barriers between what we think of as nature and what we arbitrarily categorize as domestic space, human space, our space. Such an odd concept if you think about it. As if there were some kind of alchemical process that takes place when four walls and a roof are nailed together that creates a new dimension we call the indoors. An absurd idea that does nothing but build illusory distinctions between the natural world and the places we think of as home. Friends, home is the natural world. Consider this. Scientists estimate that there are over 10,000 different species of microorganism living on and in the average human body, And that doesn't even count cryptobacteria. In fact, if a census of you were taken today, there'd be fewer human cells than those of the creatures sharing your warmth right now. Every human being walking the earth is like a person-shaped coral reef of microscopic wonder. You are a living web of life, teeming with biodiversity. And yet, we think of our air-conditioned boxes as a way to put ourselves at arm's length from the miraculous, beautiful chaos of the wild. By the double-barreled jumping Jiminy, I don't know why we bother to cultivate such fictions. With that in mind, this week we set a course for the wildest place in your home. You know the place I mean. The place where dead flies drift like autumn leaves. The place you can trust to provide a spiderweb to the face. A phantom feel of damp soil. The fine, complex scent of mildew and decaying wood. Of course, I'm talking about your basement. Don't have a basement? Well, that's what the things who live there call it. Don't ask me why. Maybe you just haven't found the door yet. Or maybe you might call it a crawl space. Cellar. Attic. Garage. Hall closet. Or stained cardboard box beneath your bed. It doesn't matter. It's yours, or it was, or it will be. Time is yellowed and brittle there, but the place knows it's yours. Your coming and going is written in enduring letters that hang in the dim air. It's your basement. I parked my Winnebago Cassandra not too far from your basement, gathered my gear, and made for that beautiful indoor wilderness. As I so often have... I aim to see what could be seen through wandering in dark places. Hey, speaking of wandering in dark places, how about a little fiction? It's time for today's Hidden Lore segment. Today's Hidden Lore is a flash fiction story called Nothing Less Rare Nor Precious by Evan Dickin. The sparrows left my chest the day I brought you home from the hospital. At first, I thought it was the crying. You were a loud, red-faced little thing, but they didn't come back even after you quieted down. I began to miss the brush of wings against my ribs, the soft prick of little beaks and claws as they hopped around inside me. It wasn't that the sparrows were a point of pride or anything. I'd kept them for the same reasons as the electric guitar gathering dust in my bedroom closet or that half-finished screenplay I'd always meant to get back to. Those derelict dreams held, if not hope, then at least nostalgia. I thought I wanted to keep you too, but maybe I was wrong. It's almost winter, hun, Alex said. Maybe they flew south. Told him my sparrows didn't migrate, but he just gave me a little straight-faced nod that meant he was agreeing to agree. Still, I did feel colder. 
It made me wonder if you'd done something to me. Somehow turned the aimless roil of clouds in my chest to sleet and snow. They're just birds, love, said my mother when I called her raw-eyed and sniffling in the middle of the night. You can't expect them to be supportive. Babies change your life, but things will get better. You'll see. They didn't, though. Alex's paternity leave ran out. The firm had given me months off, so it was just you and me alone in the house for most of the day. You slept while I watched Netflix until the edges of the flat screen lingered in my vision when I looked away. Sometimes we went for walks, stopping at the small park at the end of Hate Street to search for movement in the barren trees, whirls, cardinals, even great murmuring swirls of starlings. I don't know what I expected. Everyone knew sparrows only lived inside people now. It doesn't mean you stop being you, Haruka said, over curry and drinks at Cafe Mumbai. She had two babies, children now, and still managed to land gallery shows now and again. Just make space for what's important to you and let everything else fall away. Wasn't like I hadn't done anything with my life. Alec was wonderful. I loved my house, my friends... The hot, sweet burn of bourbon on my tongue after a long day at work. I even still got that little fluttery thrill every time I marched into a courtroom, brief in hand. How much was me and how much was just filling time? I went home and reread my screenplay. It was terrible. You seemed to enjoy the guitar, though. The chords were more than a little blurry, and I couldn't hit the high notes, but changes made you smile for the first time. We laid down on the couch after that. You sleeping tight against my chest, warm and soft. For some reason, I cried. I filled all the feeders in a mute offering. I even tried swallowing some bird seed. It rained almost every day, but I didn't mind. I loved watching them come. Goldfinches, chickadees, robins, and blue jays. Bright points of color in a world of muted grays and browns. Alec bought you a fleece-lined poncho so we could sit out on the porch together. I would point out a bird and then say its name slow like I was telling a campfire story. You would laugh and babble, pressing your hand against the porch screen like you wanted to flutter out and join them. Once I thought I saw a tiny shape flit through the trees, brown on dappled brown, but they were probably just starlings. That night I coughed up a nest, flecks of mud and tiny twigs clicking against my teeth as I hugged the bathroom garbage can. You started screaming in the other room. I didn't know what to do, but Alex changed your diaper and everything quieted down. When it was over, I tossed the garbage bag, stopping to sweep my screenplay in for good measure. It was never going to be anything anyway. I brushed my teeth and then sat in the shower for a while, head down and arms around my knees like people always do on TV when they're sad about something. Even after I toweled off, Water bled from the little knot holes between my ribs to leave dark spots on my bathrobe. You were in your crib, asleep. You rolled onto your stomach, but when I turned you over, my fingers curled into an empty space. Barely daring to breathe, I unbuttoned your onesie to see the hole that hadn't been there before. Your chest was open, warm and soft, and inside a little nest with three brown flecked eggs. Yawning, you opened your eyes and smiled up at me. For the first time, I smiled back. What a lovely story that was. Sort of a combination of body horror and magical realism. Based on what I've heard, that mix of genres seems like a pretty good representation of parenthood. I like the way in which dreams deferred become dreams transplanted in this story. Not kicked to the curb, but... Pressed down into fertile soil. And, well, you know I love the idea of framing the body as a home for things wild and fragile and inscrutable. Many of the best things in life are wild, fragile, and inscrutable. By day, Evan Dickens studies old Japanese maps and crunches data for all manner of fascinating medical research at the Ohio State University. By night, he does neither of these things. His fiction has most recently appeared in Analog, Strange Horizons, and Apex, and he has stories forthcoming from publishers such as The Black Library and Tales to Terrify. 
visit Evan Dickens' website at www.evandickens.com. The dark in your basement was different from the dark under the trees or under the sea. Certainly the dark was more complete. No moon or stars, just a razor-thin strip of light under the door at the top of the stairs, and that light did nothing but emphasize the dark. I sat on cold concrete and waited. I hoped you don't mind. You didn't seem to be at home, and, well, I felt like I was being called. I nestled myself in between old holiday decorations and water-damaged shoeboxes, listening to the monochromatic wall of sound all around me, the buzz of wires and the breath of the air ducts. Have you ever noticed that the dark itself seems to have a sound? It's an expectant sound, the sound of something holding its breath and waiting. I don't think it's the sort of sound we hear is a vibration in the air, but we hear it just the same, like a heart that beats only in the absence of light. I think it had been about an hour before I felt the hand on my shoulder. You know the hand. We've all sat in the dark long enough to feel the hand, and its touch made me nostalgic for sleepover parties in my youth and taking turns sitting in the shed waiting for the hand on our shoulders. That little childhood rhyme we all learned in kindergarten ran through my head. Little one waiting in pitch dark. Five little fingers find their mark. Will it pull you through its hidden doors? Not if you hurry and make it yours. Reach out and find your shoulder there. Give it a squeeze and say a prayer. <laughs> Kid stuff. I reached out and found my own shoulder in the blind darkness in front of me. Gave it a squeeze. Felt the squeeze on my own shoulder. So I knew the hand had to be mine. So I let go of my own shoulder and felt the hand let go in return. Just a funny trick of the dark. I figured I had waited long enough for the creatures in the basement to acclimate to my presence, so I tipped my head back and applied two drops of owl tears to each of my eyes. The effect was instantaneous. The dark was replaced by a gray-gold landscape of pure wonderment. How could I describe this? It was like... Drinking in the landscape while taking a hot air balloon ride over the Serengeti. There were inch-tall creatures like eyeless elk grazing on mildew down on the basement floor. They were cream white and walked in a sideways scuttle like a video of crabs played at triple speed. I watched a house centipede, a tiny predator that looked sort of like an escaped eyebrow dart from a crack in the floor and chase one of the elks like a lioness attacking a gazelle. I'd never seen or heard of such creature, so I tentatively named them fairy elk because of their delicate, semi-translucent bodies that reminded me a bit of fairy shrimp. I looked up from the grazing herds and found a gap hog sitting on his haunches five feet away, staring straight at me. Gap hogs are sort of like groundhogs, Except they don't burrow through ground, they burrow through, uh, I guess space-time is the easiest way to put it. I'd read about them in Jake Threepwood's seminal text, Trans-Dimensional Critters in North America, but I'd never seen one up close. It was a short, round thing, like a cross between a pug and a beaver, but with gunmetal gray fur and eyes like cigarette burns, red-ribbed holes and nothing. I reached out a hand to the little guy and triggered his defense mechanism. He cocked his head, swayed a bit, then fell forward like a paper cutout, revealing himself to be two-dimensional. For a second, I could see nothing but his silhouette against the concrete, and then it blurred and was gone. Adorable little critter, but a real nuisance to physicists. They keep a team of crypto-naturalists on staff at the Large Hadron Collider just to chase them out of the gully works. I can't say why, but when the gap hog bolted, all the creatures around me ran for it too. I was disappointed, but I wouldn't call my visit to your basement disappointing. I'd call it a success. Well now, you're not going to believe this, but speak of the devil. 
We got us a priority transmission from Jake Threepwood coming in hot over the Crypto Naturalist Radio. I wouldn't normally interrupt the show for a transmission, but old Jake is an icon in the field and he wouldn't use that priority signal lightly. Let's listen in. Jake Threepwood transmitting on Crypto Naturalist Frequency 11581 with a, let's call it conditional cry for help. Well, kids, I done did it. Old Jake's got a yarn to spin, and I hope y'all are listening. I expect you're well acquainted with the colossal cashmere possums that roam Appalachia, grazing on cottonwood trees, or soft as chinchillas, and big as garbage trucks. You folks know I was fixing to determine if the fluffy critters were true marsupials or a separate order of mammal. Case closed on that one, friends. I got too close to a sleeping female and spooked the big critter. Now, these possums are gentle giants, but I was maybe five feet away when I startled her, and, well, Paul flashed out of that cloud-like fur, and the next thing I knew, I was stuffed into a velvety pouch on the possum's belly. So, yeah, we're dealing with the marsupial here. A marsupial that has a hitherto unobserved defense mechanism. I describe it the comfort level in here is grim. Dire, even. I am disturbingly at ease. On the bright side, it is an ideal recording environment, and my gyroscopic overalls are keeping me from suffering motion sickness. But I've been in here for uh, about two days by my reckoning and I haven't been hungry or thirsty or had the first impulse to leave. Yeah. So I'm figuring that maybe one of y'all should come get me. I ain't escaping on my own. You'll pick up my shave and a haircut home and beacon once you're within 500 miles. Thanks in advance. Three put out. Oh, heck. Well, I'm not exactly close by, but I'm going to go help. Jake Threepwood is a mentor of mine, so I ain't risking that nobody will rescue him. It just goes to show you, even the true professionals can get into trouble out there, so don't get complacent. A final note about your basement as Cassandra's reactors come online. Don't take the wilderness around you for granted. When you think of the wonders of nature, your mind might conjure up images of misty rainforests, undulating kelp, eagles diving for fish in mountain rivers. Well, that's all well and good, but don't let the enormity of what's out there and the big beyond blind you to the magic and mystery in your own home, your own backyard, your basement. I'll leave you with this fact. Modern spiders are tiny miracles that predated the dinosaurs, and I bet there's one within 10 feet of you right now. Take a little time to appreciate it. Until next time, we're all strange animals, so act like it. A big thank you to Justin McElroy, the voice of Jake Threepwood. You can hear Justin on the podcasts My Brother, My Brother and Me, The Adventure Zone, and Sawbones. To learn more about Justin's work, visit McElroyShows.com. The Crypto Naturalist is written and read by Jared Anderson. Our theme song is Banish Misfortune, played by Andrew Collins. For more information about Andrew's music, visit AndrewCollinsTrio.com. Trio.com.